Welcome everyone. We're really glad that you can join us virtually. Of course, um, we wish you could join us uh, in person, especially on a glorious sunny day like this. But I hope today you'll get a little bit of a taste of what studying ASNAC, as we call it, in Cambridge is like, and, and especially in Corpus. Uh, so as Will said, you'll have a couple of academic lectures. The first from Dr. Roy Naismith, who's a fellow at Corpus, uh, who specializes in the history of England before the Norman Conquest. And then in the afternoon from uh, Eric Nableus, who's the lecturer in paleography and manuscript studies in the department. Uh, so in ASNAC, we studied the languages, history, and culture of uh, early medieval Northern Europe. So that's a mix of history, literature, languages, and um, of course, material studies. And I think Corpus um, it is a really special place to study the Middle Ages, as I think you'll get a taste today. And that's because so much of the material culture is all around you and the resources are really extraordinary. Uh, so Corpus uh, is home to the Parker Library, one of the most important collections of medieval manuscripts anywhere. And Eric will be telling you a lot more about that. And um, in normal times, we'd be taking you in uh, to get a closer look, but hopefully you can get that opportunity in the future. And Rory will be talking to you uh, about um, the, the money that they left behind and what we can learn from that. And Corpus itself is, is a fantastic medieval artifact. It hosts the only Anglo-Saxon church in Cambridge, that's St. Bennet's Church. And uh, you may find yourself living in Old Court, which is a fantastically preserved, complete medieval court. So even though we can't have you in college uh, in the flesh today, I hope you'll get a little bit of a taste of um, why Corpus is such a special place to study the Middle Ages. Uh, please feel free to ask lots of questions. Uh, nothing is too obvious. We're really happy to answer any of them. And if you think of any questions after the class that you didn't get a chance to ask, you can always contact us after and we're very happy to answer any questions. So I'm going to start by handing over uh, to Rory Naismith. We'll be giving the first talk of the day. I hope you have a fantastic time and enjoy yourselves very much. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much indeed, Brittany. I, I was going to start by telling you who I am and what I do, but that's already been done absolutely wonderfully. So I'll just dive straight in with talking to you about what it's like to study early medieval history, particularly Anglo-Saxon history. Um, this is probably a period that many of you will, will not have studied in school, um, and it's one which is populated by all sorts of different sources and materials that will be less familiar to you. Um, now that's obviously no, in no way a bad thing. We don't expect you to come in with full awareness of um, chronicles and manuscripts and all the other things that we do. Uh, that's absolutely fine, but it does mean that you're going to be sort of hitting the ground running in a very, very fun and interesting way. It's like, in some ways, trying to do a jigsaw with, with half the pieces missing, in fact, more than half the pieces missing, because we often simply don't have as much information as we'd like from this period, and it therefore means that we need to cast around and use all kinds of things that you, you perhaps wouldn't do if you were looking at, say, 20th century history, or even 19th century history. Uh, that means we need to look at, we need to look at books, as you'll hear from Eric Nableus this afternoon. We need to look at coins, as I'm going to tell you about in a minute, but we also then have a whole range of written sources. We have uh, historical texts, Bede's Ecclesiastical History, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, all sorts of things like that, but then literary compositions, charters, documentary records. And it's when we put all of these things together, it's when you, you mix them all up that the subject, I think, comes to life most vividly. And you can see how these different isolated pieces of the jigsaw puzzle speak to each other and can be put together in all sorts of imaginative and illuminating ways. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about now with a sort of little case study of how this can work with uh, Anglo-Saxon coinage. Um, uh, but I should stress that if you've got any questions at all about uh, the histories that we cover in, in ASNAC more widely about how the course works, anything of that sort, do feel free to ask me at the end when we'll have a bit of time for questions. Um, so coins, um, this is what I want to, to talk to you a bit about today. Obviously we, we know what they are and we use them. It's almost instinctive. You know, you don't have to look 
closely to decide whether you've got a, a 1p, a 2p, a 50p or a pound or whatever in your hand. It's just sort of almost instinctual after a while. We don't pay that much attention to what they actually say or what's actually on them. Of course, normally we would. Many of you are probably like me. You haven't used the coin in about a year now because of the pandemic. But in normal times, it's a very, very basic part of day-to-day -day life. And it has been a very, very basic integral part of the way people did things now for, well, depending on where you are, up to two and a half thousand years. Um, in the early Middle Ages in, in England, However, it was a little bit different. I mean, people did use coins, but they were a rather more valuable, rather more um, sort of thought-provoking operation. You know, you had to think and look closely when you used your coins. Um, if you look at, you know, if you you know reach into the back of your drawer and find a, a, a an old fifty p or a one p or something, you'll look at it and realize of course you've got a combination of images you've got text and, and you've then got physical characteristics how big it is what metal it's made of things like that um, these are the criteria we look for to try and check whether it is one thing or the other and in that sense the the people in anglo-saxon were not so very different they would also have looked at these things and those qualities to try and get a sense of what they were but they would have attached very different importance to those qualities Above all, because for, for most of the, the Anglo-Saxon period, coins were one of the only media that, that kings could actually issue that would be used and seen by most of the population. Um, you don't have, you know, broadcasts or even mass literacy or anything like that. So for most people, seeing an image of the king on the coins in their hand would have been the closest they got to dealing with the ruler, dealing with the king. And so that makes them a very, very important part of looking at this period. And here's just a few uh, images of coins from this period. Again, in normal times, I would probably be able to show you a few uh, samples of what coins from this period actually look like, a few genuine pieces, but today we've we're got to do it all online. Um, so for most people, this would be the closest they ever got to the king. Uh, another reason people would have looked at these very differently and used them very differently is that spending a penny in Anglo-Saxon times was really quite a big deal. A penny got you quite a lot. Um, penny was the main denomination that they used. They called them penning, pending, penningas in Old English. From about the year 670, they started using these silver pieces that were made out of silver, and which in fact, um, by the, the, the 10th and 11th century, if you were to hold up an Anglo-Saxon penny next to a modern one penny, you'd see that they're actually more or less the same diameter and size. The idea of how big a penny should be has been actually pretty stable for a very long time, even though the ones in this period are made out of silver. Um, and they would get you quite a lot, as I just said. Um, it's very hard to pin your finger on an exact modern equivalent um, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, for example, here's a text from the Abbey of Ely at the beginning of the 11th century, the time of King Canute, in which they talk about someone buying uh, 2,000 herring for 40p. Um, that's a lot of herring. Um, it works out at about 50 herring for one, one penny. Uh, nowadays, if you wanted to go out and buy um, 50 herring, it would probably cost you about 50 pounds. So on one level, you could say, aha, that means one P is about 50 pounds. Then again, patterns of distribution, production, flow of information about other prices were simply not as well developed in the 11th century. So it's rather harder to be sure about whether you know, 50p in, mod, well, 50 herring in modern terms cost the same as 50 herring back in the day. Nonetheless, general ballpark sense of a penny in the 10th or 11th century bought you several tens of pounds or euros or dollars or whatever that you would get nowadays. So we're dealing with coins that are really quite, quite valuable and also quite tightly controlled. You know, that the making of these things is something that's supervised very closely by the ruler. And we'll talk a bit more about how that, that works in a few minutes, but you might well be asking yourself, if you live in a world where even a penny, the standard denomination is worth 30, 40, 50 pounds, something of that order, um, is it really practical? How on earth would you get by? And you'd be right. The answer is in many ways, it's simply not very practical. Um, and there's a strong tradition of um, looking quite critically at the early medieval monetary economy, looking quite skeptically at how these things might have worked as a resource that was actually being used in real terms. Um, there was a great scholar based in Cambridge, in fact, called Philip Grierson, who looked at this issue in the, the middle part of the 20th century, 
Uh, but at that stage, the, the main finds for early medieval coins consisted mainly of hordes, that is assemblages of several, sometimes hundreds or thousands of these things that had been deliberately concealed um, at some point in the past and then not recovered until modern times. Uh, the other main repository of them was from graves, where again they'd been put there deliberately, sometimes they'd been pierced or mounted so people could wear them. And all of this suggested to him that people were using these coins in very, very specialized, restricted contexts, that these were all about symbolic payments, that these were uh, for instance, payments of a fine. There was one, one hoard of early gold coins found in Hampshire at a place called Crondall, um, which he thought added up to a hundred pieces and therefore might represent what was called a wergild. Uh, that was a compensation payment for having killed someone. So a legal context. The other example that some of you might know from watching that, that film, The Dig on Netflix recently is Sutton Who, where they get terribly excited about finding these Merovingian tremises. Um, that's to say coins made in France, but brought into England in the decades around 600. Um, and these were found as, of course, as part of a, a very grand, very elaborate uh, ship burial from the early seventh century. And the theory is, or Grierson's theory was, that since you had um, about 40 of these and the length of the ship would have allowed for about 20 oarsmen, um, that these represented a kind of payment for the guys who would row the ship into the afterlife. It's a wonderfully vivid image, but it's you know, perhaps going a little bit further than the evidence really allows. And crucially, for all that this was a very, very persuasive interpretation and one that called quite innovatively for the period on um, anthropological literature about how important gift giving had been. In fact, the situation has changed quite radically since Grierson was looking at it in the 50s and 60s. Now there's been a huge, huge surge in activity and finds of new coins by people who go out and use metal detectors. Um, many of them are amateurs, like in the, the program I put a little picture of on the, the slide here, um, who go out, discover these things and log them with the Corpus of Early Medieval Coin Finds or the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And on the back of that kind of searching and the use of metal detectors in archaeological and archaeological contexts, we've now got tens of thousands of early medieval coins known from individual finds, not part of hordes, not pierced. Um, that's very, very important because it no longer suggests that these things are part of quite such a rarefied context. These are circulating widely. They are being widely used. We still need to keep these, these numbers in perspective. For every one Anglo-Saxon early medieval coin that turns up, you'll have approximately a hundred Roman ones that have turned up. So there was simply an awful lot more coin being used previously in the Roman period, mostly because they had base metal bronze coins, which were much lower in value and much, much more widely used. Whereas the silver ones from the Anglo-Saxon period and a few gold ones too, were just much, much more valuable and correspondingly more restricted in terms of their circulation. And there were somewhat more Roman silver and gold coins around, but not by quite the same, same margin. Um, so for instance, if people dig up now, if archeologists dig up nowadays a Roman site, a Roman settlement site, it's very unusual not to find a few coins, but if someone digs up an early medieval, an Anglo-Saxon period settlement, it's actually quite rare to find any coins. It does happen periodically, but it's 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 pretty strange, pretty pretty uncommon. Um, and this is actually quite a, quite quite weird. How do we square that with now having these tens of thousands of pennies that have turned up in in the countryside, just just in fields where, where we have no reason to believe there was anything other than fields in the early medieval period? Well, one possibility is that perhaps these coins represent ones that had been used and lost in and around settlements, houses, but then perhaps been, um, been, been dropped and lost, mixed in with other detritus and rubbish, and then eventually spread out onto the fields in, in, in sort of manure, basically for fertilizing purposes. We can't be sure, of course, it's one possibility among many, but it's, it's a plausible way of thinking about how we have quite a lot of coins scattered around the countryside, but very few from actual, the actual immediate vicinity of settlement sites. Now, another important change that this new splurge of coins has, has wrought for us is that we can think more about the functions of these things. Like I said, it's not just quite as 
specific as Grierson thought these might be. Uh, these aren't just for gift giving and paying fines and stuff like that. Um, we know, for instance, that people were very, very flexible about how they would interchange coins between different kinds of use. So imagine, for instance, that uh, you want to give a gift to a church of so many silver coins. How would you get those? Well, chances are you'd have to go to a market and get them. Or if, let's say, um, you are a, a poor person, a, a pauper, a, a, a widow or an orphan or something like that, and you are given a gift of coins by a church, what was called almsgiving, uh, then the expectation was that you could go out and spend them. You go out and buy food or clothing or something like that. So all these different kinds of use are actually very, very closely intertwined. And we can see from the coins that they were indeed being used for all these purposes and all of them interlocked. And occasionally we are in a position from individual finds to be able to say, aha, these ones do represent a specific kind of use. Um, it's unusual, but there are some that, that point in that direction. So one example of this is a hoard of coins which consists of Anglo-Saxon pennies, but which was actually found in Rome, not in England itself. And there was a very strong tradition linking England and Rome. There was a sense that um, Rome was the kind of originator of, of English Christianity in the sixth, seventh centuries, and that created a special relationship that continued. The Anglo-Saxons eventually ended up giving a, a kind of annual offering to the, the papacy. Um, and this hoard of coins, 800 odd coins that was found underneath the house of the Vestal Virgins in 1883, might well represent a, a gift of that kind. Um, now, how do we know that it was meant specifically as an offering, a gift? Well, quite uniquely for Anglo-Saxon hoards, and as far as I know, any, any hoards of coins from early medieval Europe, it included a, a, an inscribed pair of fasteners, what are called hooked tags, uh, which would once have sealed, open, sealed closed the bag these were carried in. And these have an inscription on them saying, for the Lord Pope Marinus. In other words, this is a gift for the Pope. This is a donation to the papacy. And there are all kinds of interesting ways one can explore this find, this, this really, really unusual assemblage of hoard, assemblage of coins put together in the 940s. Um, we can see, uh, for instance, if we look at the, the coins themselves, that there are quite a lot from London, um, which at this point is actually relatively unusual and might suggest that we're looking at someone from that vicinity. Um, if we put that next to the dates of the coins and the dates suggested by the, the fasteners, the hook tags, there was in fact a Bishop of London who we know made a visit to Rome at that time. So it could well have been an assemblage that was brought over in his, in his group who made this trip. Um, the other striking thing about the, the inscribed fastener itself is almost what it, what, well, first of all, what it is, it's made out of solid silver. It's valuable. It's basically like having a kind of, you know, Tiffany's or Fabergé zipper on your bag, it's all about display, it's all about showing off, it suggests that this is meant to be seen, this is meant to be displayed, and the chances are that it was originally in quite a fancy bag or container. In fact, there was a little tiny fragment of the, the fabric that had been used to line that container that was still found adhering to one of these coins when they were excavated. Um, we know about this from a series of photographs that were actually taken by an, an ex-spy called Anthony Blunt, who was living in Rome at that point, and whose brother was a specialist in Anglo-Saxon coins. Um, though unfortunately that little bit of fabric was lost when the coins were cleaned um, afterwards. The other thing that's interesting about the inscription is what it doesn't say. It just says for the Lord Pope Marinus, it doesn't say who gave it. And that's actually very unusual in the early Middle Ages. It's much more common for these things to tell us who gave the gift and not just who the gift was for. That might suggest in this case that whoever was giving it expected to be there in person. You know, this is all about the recipient and the donor would be the one who actually handed it over in person, which would make sense if it is the Pope. Um, so this is a wonderful example where we can see a gift in action in terms of coins. Now, if we then go back to thinking about these, these many new finds from within England itself, we've got lots of them, they're from lots of places, they show us much, much wider geographical use and imply much wider functional use. That then suggests further that a lot of the population must have been using these things. It's not just aristocrats or bishops or even merchants. It probably includes peasants, the people who are actually working on the land, growing food, doing labor for their lords, doing all these things. Um, 
and this was used to be it used to be axiomatic that they simply didn't have the resources to to uh, to use these things on any scale uh okay that that's great peasants probably did use these things but how and why what was the purpose of using them and you know for a peasant of course the main one of the very few advantages of being a peasant is that, of course, you're growing food. You can probably cover most of your own basic needs from your own resources. So the coins probably reflect the way in which peasants, people who are working directly on the land, interface with other aspects of society and economy at the time. And part of this involves pressure from above, um, people forcing them to, to make coins and pay coins. They had to pay rent to their lord sometimes, which might involve cash, so many pennies. But they would also therefore have to get those coins by going off and selling their, their grain, their, their animals, their dairy products, whatever else, at a market. But there was also probably pressure from what you might call below or pressure from sort of, you know, the sides. That is to say, there was a there's a tendency in early medieval economic history to pin everything on the elite, on large scale landowners, lords like monasteries and, you know, kings and dukes and people like that. Uh, and that's not necessarily always, always the only thing that's going on. There's more to it than that. It's better to think of a more complicated and layered set of relationships um, with money as one important tool for smoothing the way resources pass from one group to another. So thinking back to our peasants, it's simply not actually very helpful to think of them just as one undifferentiated homogenous mass who live in this sort of, you know, proto-communist idyll where they all try and support one another. Emphatically not. In fact, there were a lot of gradations within peasant society. Uh, we know that they were often exploiting one another, lending, leasing land out to one another, taking rent or other kinds of offerings from one another. Some of some peasants worked as wage laborers or kind of casual laborers, building things for, for lords and other people. There's an awful lot more to it than just, you know, lords squeezing peasants. It's also peasants squeezing each other and peasants taking advantage of um, these coins to, to well, make more money and in some cases even pool themselves up to being among those among those lords. So, so there's a lot of a lot of different kinds of interaction going on here. Um, and this leads, uh, leads us on to then another quandary with the coinage. Use of coin that's already there is one thing, um, but why and how when new ones actually made? That's actually, a, there's actually a big difference between the two. Broadly speaking, the relatively small and inconsistent demand that you'd expect from peasants is unlikely to have been enough in and of itself to sustain the manufacture of coins, at least on any significant scale. That is to say, the making of these things is really quite an involved process. You have to, first of all, get your your silver, um, you then have to melt it down. You have to check that the alloy is, is as it should be, that it contains enough silver, but also a little bit of copper, uh, a little bit of other metals too, to try and make it as, as hard and durable as it should be. Uh, there might also be periods when you're, you're under order, the moneyers who are making these things are under orders to um, debase them, let's say to include less silver or gold than they would normally have done. Um, once you've done all of that, uh, which is the most technically demanding part of the process, you then have to um, make your actual little bits of metal and you have to make sure they weigh the right amount. They controlled that very carefully. Um, and then finally, you actually have to strike them with what were called dies. These are stamps that would be um, impressed into little iron columns with steel on the bottom. Um, and that steel would carry the design that was meant to be put on the coin. That's obviously the most obvious bit for us you know we we are very interested in the images and the text that these things carry but actually that was very much the icing on the cake in terms of the process of production um, doing all the other stuff with the metal took a lot more time and a lot more expertise that means that if our peasants like on the slide i've got here turned up with you know five pennies it's very unlikely that a moneyer would have been able to make a sustainable operation um, out of just turning those five coins into five new coins. He'd want other pennies, he'd want a, a larger pool of bullion to work with, basically. So it's not impossible that these peasants did bring in their coins at certain points under certain conditions, but they may have paid a premium for bringing in fewer, and it's much more likely that the actual process of production was driven by larger amounts of silver coming from 
different directions or maybe from a, a large number of directions that you've got a pool of currency that's being brought together. Now I've used this term moneyers. Um, moneyers are the characters who put their names on coins and they start doing this in England from actually a very early stage. We have some moneyers named as early as the 600s but from the 700s it became completely standard to put the name of the person who made the coin on each and every silver penny. They thought about this very much in personal terms. Uh, obviously the king's image and name was there. He provided a kind of overall guarantee and sanction. His laws would require that everyone had to accept a decent coin. But the reason that you put the money as name on the coin was in case you had a problem with it. If you found that a coin was defective, um, that it wasn't as heavy as it should be, or the silver wasn't as pure as it should be, the idea was you could say, aha, you know, that Alfwald and Stafford has been trying to pull a fast one. Now we can go and find him and, you know, get recompense. And there were very, very strict penalties in place in Anglo-Saxon law for those who were caught forging coins. In fact, it, we know that you'd normally have your hand cut off and stuck on a spike on top of the building where you'd committed the crime. And we know that in the early 1100s, when a bunch of moneyers were convicted of forgery, they not only lost their hands, but their testicles as well, because that was seen as, it was seen as giving a sort of false testimony. It undermined their capacity to act as proper men. So don't do it, basically. Don't forge coins. Um, but moneyers were, of course, in a position to do that, and they were in a position to do an awful lot. Um, there were a great many of these moneyers. Uh, about 2,000 of them are known from the century or so before the Norman Conquest. And I want to focus a little bit on that period, that last late Anglo-Saxon period, because the coinage at this stage is exceptionally rich and amenable to looking at these issues of how things are working on a local level. Earlier on we tend not to get um, any information besides the name of the money, so it can be hard to know exactly where they worked, but by this stage it's completely standard to get the name of the location where the money has worked as well. So as you can see on these coins typically they'd say something along the lines of Alfwald in Stafford, um, Leofstan in London, and so on and so forth about 2,000 money years, and we know of about 112 um, or so, 100, actually more like 113 places where these coins were being being made. Um, obviously that means you'd often have, you'd have several money years per location, sometimes an awful lot of them. At London you might have up to nearly 80 operating within just the space of a few years, whereas you have an awful lot of these little mint places, you can see on the map there where they are, down in the southwest especially where they'd only operate very briefly. You might have only one, two, three coins surviving now. Um, and you know it's clearly a very, very different world. The other thing that makes this late Anglo-Saxon period especially um, productive is that we can get a better handle on the chronology. And that's because every few years, um, not quite regularly, but frequently, they would bring in new designs of coin that were used across the kingdom. All the mints would switch over at pretty much the same time. And so we can build up a sequence. The relative order of these things is very clear. And so we can say, aha, this money lasted roughly this long, that money lasted roughly this long, and so on and so forth. We can get quite a good grip on the, the, the way in which this currency is working. So this period is very, very good for looking at this, this monetary system. And you might well be asking yourself, why on earth do they need over 100 places making coins and 2,000 people making coins? Bearing in mind that within each of these mint places, it's likely that the money is all independent operators. We know this from um, documents preserved in Winchester. They tell us that each money had his own separate workshop, dealt with money as on, dealt with customers on his own account. So why? Wouldn't it have been a lot more efficient to, to centralise these, these processes as they started doing in the 12th and 13th century? Well, the likely reason for this is that it's because the moneyers, this personal operation, was actually quite integral to the making of the coinage. It's, it's probably the case that these moneyers would work to serve networks of people based on um, things like lordship, patronage, and so on. So a moneyer would probably not just set up shop and hope for the best, um, rather someone who had the skills and the connections that were appropriate to a money, um, so knowing about metals, but also knowing about how uh, government processes involving, you know, taxes and 
others and rents and all these other things that went up and down between kings and their agents those were the kinds of skills and money you would have to have to possess uh, they would be then steered into minting either themselves or by their friends and associates who want to have a person who can manage this process for them um, so it's probably a matter of dialogue and interchange between um, people who work with and around moneyers. Um, and there might well be specific instances that would push them into doing that work. The most obvious one is when you'd hang, change over between these types of coin and most of the circulation currency would be reminted. That meant that many people, well, probably everyone eventually who had old coins, we changed them for new coins, obviously a uh, 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 huge amount of demand for new minting but there might also have been taxes fines other circumstances in which new coins were were stipulated and necessary so i want to illustrate this with uh, a last example of how this might have worked in practice what this might have looked like um, and it starts off with a, a document in the british library that contains a set of statutes for a, a guild of thanes in cambridge but also a um a record of a grant of land by a chap called alfhelm alfhelm polger um, he's known from other sources to his goldsmith as the text says you can see it on the second line about halfway along in that document on top um, his goldsmith um, who's a character called Leofseer. now Leofseer um, emerges in a whole series of other documents from both Ely and another nearby abbey called Ramsey uh, and from this we can see that he's actually a member both by sort of uh, sort of blood relation and by marriage of two aristocratic families, uh, one of them with Alfhelm and another around a figure called Athelstan, son of Man, Manusun. Um, so this seems to have brought Leosia relative wealth. He himself owned about four or five pieces of land uh, in, the, in the region. I've put those on a map underneath. Um, so we're dealing with someone who had an occupation goldsmithing that would surely have meant he knew about precious metals and probably was also connected with towns and markets um, but this was not the only orbit in which he moved he's also a member even if a junior member of these two aristocratic families and he's benefiting from that sort of connection these are the people who are coming to AFC are saying I need these coins can you do it and yes he does and there might well have been um uh, other people who are their friends, family, other connections, um, their tenants, the peasants who live in their lands. Laofsia himself may well have had peasants, tenants who lived in these lands that he, he possessed. There are all of these informal connections that were probably essential to the process of minting. In other words, it was all about who you knew and how you got in touch with a person who could do this service. And the further you were from those networks, the more difficult and expensive it would be. And so, of course, this tended to prejudice people who were in positions of power, who were well connected, and it tended to be worse for those who were, again, peasants who lived further away, were less tightly integrated into that sort of world. Um, so this is a really, really great example of what the moneyers might actually have done. We can do the same sort of thing by looking at Doomsday Book from the middle part and well 1066 and then 1086 where we hear about lots of landowners all over the country many of whom were moneyers many of whom like Laosia were relatively minor in terms of how much property they owned but who we can see were plumbed into these networks that went both up and also down um, that's really crucial because the moneyers weren't just bigwigs who were dealing only with the, the super rich they were dealing very much with people who were further down as well and who themselves sat in the middle. Um, they tended to be what you'd call in the late Middle Ages gentry, you know, sort of well-to-do people who'd be important within their local area, but probably not on a, a national or even a, a regional basis. So most money, as I say, did not serve the general public at all. They made coins for specific patrons, for friends and associates. Um, this is the key, I think, to how and why coins were actually made in Anglo-Saxon England. It's not just about people wanting money, it's about people wanting it in quite specific, targeted and well-managed ways. Um, so it's all about human geography superimposing onto institutional geography. This is just an example of what you can do in as ASNAC style history with coins and also a bit of charters and other sources, ending up, I think, with a really rich and interesting addition to how we understand the society of this period, uh, which is 
exactly what ASNAC is all about. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I see I've already got a couple coming up on the, the chat bar. So do type in any more that you might have. Like I said, happy to use, uh, happy to answer anything about the course more widely or about what I've just been talking about with the coins. Um, I've got a first anonymous attendee. Sorry, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm not able to say to who your name are, who just asks what language did they use. Uh, if we're talking about the the inscriptions on these coins, which I assume you are, uh, it's 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 a, a combination of languages. Most of the names are Old English of Old English derivation. Some are of Old Norse derivation, or occasionally even Irish or other der other other backgrounds. Um, but you also will have Latin used for the the king's title and the moneyers. Um, job description. They will often say that on the coin. There are very few that actually use Old English, especially from York in the years around 940 when the Vikings take over. They want to make a point of doing things differently. So they have the king's title in Old English and the money as job description in Old English. Okay, uh, next one. Have any coins been found with the money as stamp? Uh, well, yes, an awful lot. Um, almost all of them, in fact, have a money as name on them. We do actually have about, um, I think, four or five examples of the dies, the stamps that were used to make these coins also surviving. Um, there are a few from London, there's one from Lincoln, a couple from York that were found in the Coppergate excavations. Um, and of course, there must have been an awful lot more. So yes, the moneyers were a crucial part of this process and they tell us a lot about themselves. Um, Okay, uh, next question I've got is, if money has lost their hands, would this likely lead to death or were they medically advanced to stop bleeding out um, and getting infections? Well, I suspect often it would have been fatal because as you say, they, they, you know, they could stop bleeding, they could stitch people up again. They did have some rudimentary ways of trying to, to help these injuries heal, but yes, you would be at, uh, at risk of, of death from all sorts of the horrible things that could happen to you in the early Middle Ages. So yes, this would often have been basically a, a death sentence, and even if it wasn't, it wouldn't have been a lot of fun. Uh, does the course include analysis of the imagery on objects like coins? Absolutely, yes, it does. I talked about, I didn't talk about this too much now, just in the interest of time, but yes, there's a huge amount that you can say about these. Um, I mean, if I just uh, zip back up to the previous slide, you might be able to see the second lower down coin here, which is of what's known as the Agnes Day type. This is a wonderfully interesting coin, which I could talk about all day. Um, very, very rare. There's only about 24, 25 of these surviving compared to thousands of the other types of Ethelred the Unready. It was issued very briefly at a period when they're desperately trying to get God on side to help them against the Vikings. So they use the coin as part of that effort. It's a great illustration of the, the sort of moralized dimensions of the currency at this point. They don't reform it just to make money or just to, you know, just for the hell of it. They're, they're doing this as a way of sort of purifying themselves, that if you can make your money good and reliable and trustworthy, it's the same as making your sort of inner self, your inner soul good and trustworthy. And that's keyed into a long-standing tradition in Christian and patristic literature of using money, coined money, as a metaphor for the human soul. That you can't necessarily see what it looks like on the inside, you can just see what it looks like on the outside. And so that is sort of reversed in the Middle Ages, in the minds of kings. If you make the coins good and pure, you're making um, yourself and your kingdom good and pure. Okay. Uh, analysis of imagery on the coins. Um, was the money responsible for minting coins or did they oversee the process and ensure quality after someone else made the coins? Probably the latter is more common. The moneyers were more managers, people who had connections and skills, but who would not actually sit there with a the hammer doing all the actual hard work. Probably varied a bit depending on where you were. At small mints, it's more likely that the money would have done those jobs. But if we're talking about some of these characters in London or York or Lincoln who are doing, uh, you know, working on a very large scale, lots of different things going on, probably they would have underlings. And that's referred to in some law codes that the money has had employees. Um, I say they didn't use coins widely. What did they use for most of their trading? Did they just trade resources? Well, by that, I presume you mean barter. Did they just exchange things directly? Um, yes, they did a bit of that. Um, but the crucial thing is that you'd often think of things in monetary terms. So there's a difference between, let's say, I give you a sheep and you give me a cow. This is instead, I give you a sheep worth four shillings and you give me a cow worth four shillings. It's thinking about other stuff in terms of the coins that it would be worth if you had them. 
So I think that's really crucial. People thought in terms of money, even if they didn't always use coin. And there were some other commodities that had a kind of pseudo monetary function. So for instance, we know that in, in uh, early medieval Iceland, they used fabric in that way. In uh, Norway and possibly Scotland, they used butter in that way. Anything that you've got a, a, a supply of, but not a limitless supply of, you can, and which isn't going to sort of die off or, run away or decay or anything like that, you can theoretically use it as money. Coin has the advantage it remains stable and more or less universally desirable and the price isn't going to vary massively if you take it a long distance. So that's the attraction of it, but yes, other commodities can serve that role too. Okay, um, in the course will there be a lot of language you need to learn? Well, the beauty of ASNAC is that it's set up in such a way that you, you choose over your first two years six options from the papers that we have available. And there's about, I think, 13 or 14 of these, um, plus a few that we borrow from other departments. Uh, you can choose any of those six. So if you're mad keen on doing all the languages, you absolutely can. If you want to do um, mostly historical uh, papers, you can do that too. We try to encourage most people to do, at, we encourage people to do at least one language, because it's really crucial to, I think, get get a handle on the original texts, interpret them in the, the original language. Though obviously you don't need to do that for all of them, um, but to get some sense of that for the, the Anglo-Saxons or the Vikings or the, the Welsh or the Irish or whoever is really a big part of what ASNAC is all about. So there's a lot of flexibility. We encourage you to do at least one language, but not necessarily all of them. Okay. Right, a uh, question from Marco. Was it common to inscribe the name of the king or the money in runes as on the part of coin? Well spotted, they do indeed use runes. Runes are more common earlier. They're used quite often in the seventh century and the, in the eighth century, uh, they're used in the seventh century. In the eighth century, they become a bit more specialized. In the reign of Offa of Mercia, for example, who's king between 757 and 796, the runes are used um, almost exclusively in East Anglia. They're also used almost exclusively for the name of the mania, not the name of the king, which suggests that they think about these differently. So broadly speaking, yes, the runes are more popular on coins earlier rather than later, though they carry on being used in other contexts, in other sorts of inscriptions, long after they disappear from the coins. Um, and it looks like it's just a matter of what is the, the local preference. Um, Okay, another anonymous question. Can I recommend any books or further reading around this subject area? Well, absolutely, yes, I can. And there's some information about that on our departmental website to which I, I uh, refer you. Um, so go and have a look there. If any of you want to know more specifically about the coins, send me an email and I'll forward you some, some details. Um, that's absolutely fine, very happy to do that. Um, question from Esme. Uh, if the money was able to buy quite a lot, would people buy things to last a long time or were there amounts that were very small? Um, I think probably mostly the first of these, you'd, you'd buy in bulk where you could. Um, and it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's obvious where you think about it, that they do things like, for instance, calibrate um, their bread so that it was worth, so you'd, you'd make the loaf as much as you could get for a, a, a farthing, for instance, rather than the other way around. You know, you'd go in with a coin and say, you know, I want you to cut up this much bread. If you think about it, you, you try to make your commodities fit the denominations that you've got. Um, so it looks like there was a certain amount of that, though even with a quarter of a penny, that's still quite a bit. So it mostly was a matter of buying in bulk. Also, also um, primitive forms of credit would have been important. Um, you'd buy now and, well, you'd get your commodities now and pay later or the other way around. Um, this was very common because, of course, most people are dealing with um, contexts in which they all know each other pretty well. Um, okay, uh, question, anonymous question, how many coins did each money produce per year? I wish I knew. Uh, we don't have any records that tell us about that. Some people like to undertake estimates based on how many surviving coins we have and how many died, how many stamps you can see among them. Um, you obviously can't tell how many of them were made per year, though of course you occasionally have coinage that we know must have been made within one year, like for instance Harold Godwinson, um, who becomes king in January 1066, is killed in October 1066. If you put together those bits of information and you do various bits of statistical jiggery-pokery, you can get a sense of uh, how many coins we think might have been made, and the answer is basically a lot. That these moneyers could have been making thousands, perhaps tens or hundreds of thousands, but basically we, we, we don't know for sure. And it probably varied an awful lot depending on where the money was, 
what the situation was in terms of demand, lots and lots of things that fed into how many they were made, making, but theoretically a lot, I think is the short answer. And the key variable would have been how many people were asking for it and how much silver they were bringing to, to, to support that. Um, okay. Uh, does the, do, do, do Cambridge University hold coins in their libraries? Not in the libraries, they used to, but they now, con the collections are now consolidated in the Fitzwilliam Museum. And the Fitzwilliam has got a very, very good collection of Anglo-Saxon coins, which we make extensive use of in teaching in ASNAC. Not in COVID times, of course, but yes, we would indeed be going to look at coins in the flesh in the museum. Um, do you need to learn Old English? Not required, though it's certainly an option. Um, how did people send the, out the dies or stamps? There's a question from Mitchell. Uh, how did they send the stamps specific to each king out to each mania? Why change the stamp so much if it was difficult to change every mania's stamp? Um, excellent question, Mitchell. Um, it would take a long time to answer uh, in full, but the main thing is that the, the stamps were made in, sometimes in just one single place, uh, more often in maybe half a dozen places across the kingdom. Um, there would have been messengers or written documents sent back and forth so the money is new what name to put on them sometimes you can even see from the spellings that are used when they they change from one maker of these dies to another um you know so there's clearly initiative going on at both ends of that exchange um why change the stamp so much if it's difficult that goes back to this point about the coin is not necessarily just being a matter of efficiency and economy it's a matter of what you might call morality and the spiritual standing of the kingdom you don't do you're doing this to try and make sure that you don't have forgeries in circulation you're doing it to show to god that our coins are pure and reliable that seems to have been the main motive for why they're doing all of these these recoinages um okay uh, sorry, I'm having trouble getting my thing to scroll up and down. Uh, what was the punishment for trying to clip parts off the coins? We don't have any information about this specifically, though it was probably done. Any kinds of crime that involved messing with the coins were, well, they didn't necessarily incur losing hands and losing testicles. That was specifically forgery. Um, it's more likely that lesser crimes of that sort would incur a heavy fine. There is, in fact, one law code which says that if... Um, uh, people hand over coins which are dodgy, but they can't claim, they can't prove where they got them. What they need to do is exchange them for good coins, but at an especially poor exchange rate. So it's basically a, a financial penalty in cases like that. Um, what era did coins replace exchange of goods for peasants and lower class? Well, it had, uh, it, it had already happened to some extent in this period, and it had happened on a larger, a larger extent in the Roman period. It's it doesn't ever happen totally. I mean, even down to the early modern period, the 18th, 19th century, even the 20th century, in rural settings, people would often do a lot more uh, what we'd call barter. You know, you exchange goods for goods. Um, you might think of them in terms of money. Um, yeah, so I'd say that this is something that we can see, especially clearly in the early Middle Ages, but which went on later as well. Um, were there only pennies at that time or were there more valuable coins? Question from Holly. Um, pennies were by far the most popular. You could cut them into halves or you cut them into quarters if you wanted smaller coins. For more valuable coins, that there were a very few gold pieces being made in the later Anglo-Saxon period. They called them mancuses usually. These looked basically like pennies, except they'd be made of gold and they'd weigh about three times as much because gold is, is a lot heavier and denser. Um, so yes, uh, that you could make more valuable coins, um, but uh, it was um, more of a it was more of a challenge to to, to use those. Of course, um, did people shave the edges off the money at this point in time? Um, probably, uh, probably not on a large scale. Is the short answer to that, Freya? Um, you, they probably indulge more in what's called because there is a there, that was a crime in the later Middle Ages and early modern times where you'd be you might have come across this in the 16th century, for example, thinking about the Great Debasement with Henry VIII. In the early Middle Ages, the, the, they tried to protect against that by making the coins very, very round. They used something like a heavy duty pastry cutter um, to go stamp, stamp, stamp and get these coins that are more or less perfectly round. So it's actually very obvious if someone's done that and it tends not to be the preferred way of getting getting money out of them. But there were other ways of sneaking a bit of extra silver out of the coins. There was what was called sweating coins. If you took very fresh ones um, and you put them in a bag and you shook it really, really hard, um, and then you took the coins out, you'd have little, little sort of shavings, little tiny bits of silver dust that had rubbed off from the coins. And if you did that many times and collected it up, 
you'd have some extra bonus silver that you could go off and do something with. We don't know for sure if they were doing that in the Anglo-Saxon period, but it's certainly it's certainly possible. Um, okay, uh, did their monetary system, system deal with inflation and instability? Um, it did, but we don't know very much about how because we have very little information about prices. We can infer, for instance, that when there was massive debasement in Northumbria, the Kingdom of Northumbria in the ninth century, that the coins that resulted, made basically just out of copper, were only being were much lower in value, and so you need a lot more of them to buy things. Actually, made them much more versatile. But yes, it would be a matter would be a matter of inflation. Otherwise, we we simply have quite limited information on whether they they how much they grasped the idea that if you pump lots of money into circulation, if you debase it, it increases prices. They they would certainly see the results, but whether they understood all the sequence of cause and effect that was going on is less clear. How does Anglo-Saxon link with English literature? Well, Old English is the term that's normally used nowadays for the literature and language of the Anglo-Saxons. In fact, even the term Anglo-Saxon, for all that I've used it today, is, is one that is a slightly tricky, tricky term because it's been co-opted for all sorts of unpleasant racist and uh, extremist purposes by by certain groups in modern times so you'll see some people being a little bit hesitant about using the term anglo-saxon um if you do use you have to be very clear that it's being used in a historical context that you don't think that we now all are sort of proud anglo-saxon people that's simply not true and it's a very very dangerous way of thinking about the subject so old english is the term that's preferred for the language and literature Question from Ben Cook. Um, why were there very few mint places in the north of England? Excellent question, Ben. Um, the short answer, I think, is that there was just a tradition established in the Kingdom of Northumbria from a very early stage, going back to the eighth century, of having a very centralized system, of having the manufacturer coin based in York. And that tradition carried on all the way through the later Anglo-Saxon period. Worth saying that if you go further north than Yorkshire, um, there simply were far fewer coins being used and lost, and there wasn't any manufacture of them down till, uh, well, until the late 11th century, until the, the period after the Norman conquest. So it's due with centralization in Yorkshire and simply not having the, the um, basically having the demand and circulation and tradition of it further north. Question from Grace, was England a single market? Uh, no tariffs and coins accepted everywhere. Um, as far as we know, yes, though there would be um, tolls. Uh, well, in a way, I, I suppose it wouldn't be a single market and you'd have tolls with bridges, roads, some towns and markets. In a way, you don't have as big international tolls and tariffs. That's less prominent, but you have an awful lot of local ones. So in a sense, it's much more complicated in another a lot less so. Going internationally with coin is probably not that big a deal, but moving about locally between different jurisdictions and towns probably would have cost you. But the coins would have been interchangeable across the kingdom. There's no evidence that you had to use coins from London within the area around London or coins from York and Yorkshire or anything like that. You could use coins from anywhere anywhere else in the kingdom. Question from Becky. Uh, how was there such a common understanding of how much material a coin was worth? Would this change as you moved around England? Yes, prices would indeed change as you moved around England. There was some, there was some variation in terms of weight of the coins that were being made at the same time. Coins tended to be heavier in areas that were further west where there was probably a bit less demand and slightly lower scale production. The theory is that that was an incentive for people to bring in their silver, that you'd, you'd basically be getting a slightly better deal. Whereas in the east, when they're making these on a massive scale, the, there's an awful lot of, well, the weights are often a bit lower. Um, where was the silver source? The question from Will. Again, a wonderful question that I could, I've been writing about recently and could talk about all day. Basically, the silver was sourced mainly from overseas. There were silver mines later on in um, parts of northern England and the southwest, but there's no evidence that these are being used on a large scale in the Anglo-Saxon period. We're mostly talking about silver from a set of mines in western France at a place called Mel, uh, from various places in Germany, the Hartz Mountains, um, uh, Wiesloch in, in the southwest, um, possibly some reused silver from earlier times. The short answer is a hodgepodge, a number of different sources, but clearly a lot. And in the immediate context of reminting the coins that were there in the late Anglo-Saxon period, of course, the short answer is the coins they already had in those cases was where they got the silver for the next ones. And you've got a constant drip flow of new silver coming in from outside. Question from Leonidas, uh, was currency universal? Would the English use the coins made in Rome? Um, the short answer is usually no. 
Um, foreign coin that was being brought into England would normally have to be reminted and turned into local coin. A um, little bit more complicated in some other places. There's evidence that Anglo-Saxon coin could probably be used in Italy and Rome in some contexts in the 10th century, um, but it, it, it depended on where you went in other contexts. Um, uh, Annabelle, was it easy to get around without coins? Probably yes, as I said before, that there are other ways of doing things. Um, anonymous, uh, even though there was a need for spirituality and purity, was there still corruption within the church? Yes, there was, a lot. Um, uh, anonymous, was there competition between moneyers? Probably, but we don't know for sure. Um, we know that you sometimes had a number of them working alongside each other in the same town. There's even one example from London of a money who names the street on which he works, implying that there were two with the same name in different parts of the city. Um, so entirely possible that we don't know for sure. Uh, anonymous, did the Vikings and Normans bring over, bring coins over from Scandinavia and Normandy, or did they just change the minting once they took over the country? Um, the Vikings mostly took coins back from England and the Normans mostly had mostly used the coins from England itself. In fact, the coinage of Normandy itself around time of the Norman conquest is pretty crappy. Um, it's a lot less closely controlled, a lot less standardized than the coins from England. In fact, once William came into England, he thought the Anglo-Saxon coinage was the bee's knees. So they, they actually take over a lot of what they see the Anglo-Saxons doing and take that back to Normandy. Um, would some coins be used by the Norse when they settled in England? This is a question from Max, or would they bring their own currency? The Vikings used uh, silver in, in the, they, they paid more attention to the bullion factors of silver. So as long as it was decent, as long as they were decent coins, you just used them wherever they came from. Um, you weren't worried about whether they were coins or not. Um, sorry, we'll have to finish in a moment because I think we're due to have our, our student helpers appearing in a moment. Um, one, I'll just do a couple more. Someone's asked about my, uh, something I wrote about Islamic coins, Alessio. Uh, I say that Islamic coins didn't uh, become as popular in England and Scandinavia, simply it's because they come to Scandinavia first. Um, Scandinavia and the Baltic is the first, well, is where these are being brought from the Muslim world. And then from there, a smaller proportion is taken west. Um, okay. Uh, how would international trade have worked? Well, you take these coins overseas, often you don't have to remint them when you got there. Um, question from Annabelle, were coins that came from abroad used and were they more valuable? Um, not in and of themselves more valuable, but you'd normally, like I say, have to remint them and turn them into the local coins. So you could use those. Bit different in the seventh and eighth century, you could use other coins a bit more, bit more freely, um, but it looks like there wasn't any particular premium to them being from overseas. As long as they were decent, recognizable coins, good silver, good gold, you could use them. Uh, anonymous asking about tin. Um, tin was available from Cornwall. Yes, it was, but it wasn't used on a large scale in the coins of England in this period. It was used more significantly to make um, some of the base metal alloys um, that, that the Romans used for their coins. So yes, it was important, but not really for the coins. Uh, last question from Antha. Uh, what is the earliest coin to record? Well, coins from um, Greece, uh, well, Western Asia Minor, about 650 BC. Uh, from England, we know that they were making coins from about the year 600 and using all the Roman ones. Okay, uh, so I think that's all the questions, of which there were a fair few. Um, if anyone has any more, do email me.